Uh, hello and welcome, and welcome, thank you for coming. The last lot of the last day in the last room of the convention center. We really appreciate your effort. We really are. And uh, this is Mark Galpin, solution architect at JFrog, at Magalpin on Twitter. And this is Baruch Sodogorsky. He's our developer advocate, so you probably get to listen to him talk a lot. Uh, at and, Jay Baruch. And on today Twitter will and everywhere be no exception. You will hear me talk a lot, because <laughs> this is what I do. Um, all right, so um, we are going to talk about how you take your containers to production. Say that's the, yep, trust your containers in production, offline and off online and offline. And this is what we are going to show you. It will be most of it will be demo because that's what you can do in 20 minutes. And we have like five slides for you. So this is one of them, and appreciate every one of them because there is not much, right? So, and um, this is part one when everything goes wrong. And uh, that's our normal day at work, of course. And I will start by showing you some uh, terminal here. Isn't it cool? Um, I hope the font is big enough. I'm going to do a Docker images on my machine. Everybody use Docker here? No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, Docker images, and you might have much more images that I do, and I worked really hard to clean them up for the sake of this demo. And uh, let's talk about this one. So this is a nice image, it's called Docker App, very descriptive, so you have no idea what it is. And it has this marvelous tag of latest. Um, what does it mean, latest? Any ideas? What does latest mean? Have, guys, we don't have a lot of time. I need answers. What is latest? Nothing, thank you very much. That's a precise answer. Latest means whatever. It can be a latest image or not. It can refer to a certain image version or not. Basically it means we have no idea what's going on. Well, more accurately it means that latest is something that somebody picked to call latest. Um, the fact that people have expectations around the concept of what latest is is a different problem, um, and it is, you know, to be fair, one, you know, the Docker community as a whole, we're all trying to address, but it's still very common. How many of you have a Docker file that pulls a latest tag? Oh, don't be shy. It's a horrible thing to do, but we will love you anyhow. Yes, it does. But and yes. you have no idea what you just did. Yeah, this is how we love it. That's the magic of Docker. Yes, and and by the way, it's not. I told you I will insult people. Yeah, it's not. It's not always a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the reason why Docker tags are so confusing, um, you know, for people that are used to doing Docker versions is that Docker actually had somewhat of a really good idea, um, as much as it um, sometime hurt, sometimes hurts from my perspective of caring about things like you know, immutable testing and that sort of thing, but the, the really good idea behind the way the tags work in Docker, uh, sort of by convention, is the idea that whenever I pull an image, it should be one that's patched. Right, so if, you know, even if I don't pull the latest tag, if I pull a specific tag, you know, the idea with Docker is that when I'm pulling a base layer, especially if I'm pulling like an OS image, right, the objective is not to pull the OS image from two years ago that has every known day zero exploit in it. So, well, well, as, as we mentioned here, latest actually means latest image you can trust if you download it from a trusted source. This is what it means. For our example, um, unfortunately that won't work because imagine that this image was something that was running in your production environment and now it misbehaves and actually people ask you to look into it. The problem is that the tag is latest, which means it's a good image. For us it means we really don't know. Exactly. Now there is a solution there. There is something that identifies the image uh, in a very solid and unambiguous way. What it is? ID, thank you very much. Uh, that we already been through this part, sorry. And now we are, we already been through that part. Yes. I did too much slides, I guess, <laughs> right? And, and, and of course, uh, the ID is what actually helped us. 
And um, we can get that from the descriptor, uh, from the package descriptor by uh, uh, running docker inspect and getting the ID out of it. And this is what we are going to do. And uh, this is a great, um, I think that's one of the best um, signatures I ever saw. Uh, the, the problem is that we still have no idea what it refers to. It's 6322B. Well, I told you it's one of the best I ever saw. Right? It's solid. It's a good, very good one. Um, and, and, and the next question is, OK, now what? So now we identified our image. We know what it is. And the next question would be, what can we do with that? Yeah. So I mean, at this point, we've really got to be able to figure out, you know, if the latest tag didn't tell me something about where this image came from, you know, all it says is that when I pulled it, it was the best known good image. Hopefully, hopefully that was the convention that somebody was using when they tagged it. It was the best known good image that somebody was supposed to pull. So, but now we actually have a problem. We need to actually know where did that image come from? What is inside that image? And with this checksum, we should be able to start figuring that out. Um, but you need to be able to do a search and see what other metadata is out there on this. We basically, usually, most things that are tagged latest, if people are following um, fairly standard naming conventions, most things that are tagged latest also exist under another tag. Because latest will be a synonymous and kind of symlink to another version which we, want to, which we want to find. So we can search by checksum and find this image in our Docker registry. And uh, whoa, we just said that this is kind of a unique thing. How we ended it with five of them? So this is a, a pretty clear answer here. So of course, the latest tag was unsurprisingly, uh, in fact, in this case, it was still the latest tag. That's the one that we looked at. And then it looks like here you've got uh, two different builds of the same Docker image. You built it twice. Nothing actually changed. You did a no-op build. That happens sometimes. Um, and uh, it looks like we also have two repositories. So we promoted this image. Um, so those are different registries inside Artifactory, which we promoted between them with copy. Yes. So it was, it started in dev, and then it went to prod. So that's why we have two copies. And when we actually were ready to put it in production, we also called it latest. So that actually makes sense. Yeah. Now, how do we figure out what went wrong with this image? We can navigate to one of them and take a look. And look, we have Docker Info tab that actually, first of all, lays out all the Docker layers. And we can actually know what's going on. So let's take a look at this one. What did we do here? We uh, added a swamp of war file. So, um, so you know, we did a fairly typical thing. We didn't add a swamp of war file. We added this wonderful file, 91D116F, and named it as a, swarm, a swamp of war file. What is swamp up, by the way? Swamp up is uh, our user conference in Napa. So uh, we had to plug it somewhere because marketing wouldn't pay for our airline otherwise. So, uh, it's uh, in May, uh, 24th to 26th, in Napa, good wine, good weather, good talks, DevOps people, you should be there. Okay, so, um, sorry, we got distracted. We took this file that we have no idea about and named it swampup.war and put it in our image. And that's our application, actually. Yes, and so far, um, I haven't shown you anything that um, you know, several other Docker registries can't do. Um, but uh, this is about to change. Oh, yes. Now, what we know in our repository is how this image was built. We go to our build browser right here, and we can see that this is a Docker image that will build. First of all, we know that it was on Jenkins now, and we know it took 20, 47 seconds, and we have a link to Jenkins, and that's pretty awesome. Because in the Jenkins build results, we can see the commit that probably contains some code that broke our Docker image, didn't it? Mm. That commit is probably pretty old. 
Um, that's our Docker file. Commit. And you think nothing actually changed there and there are no problems? You know what? It might be some environment variable. We can see them all right here. They were captured during the build. We might compare this build with the previous build and see maybe some dependencies changed. Or maybe we did something wrong and, you know, some kind of stuff around there. So, yeah, a dependency changed, but only the war file. And that's the war file that was changed. Oh, yes. And by the way, can we know what the war file was? Uh, so this is really where it gets really cool. Um, so um, for those of you who are familiar with Artifactory, we've had um, a concept of build information for a long time. But we only recently added um, this concept of integrating build information with Docker um, using Jenkins pipelines. Um, and one of the cool reasons to do this is to be able to track, hey, I downloaded a certain set of artifacts from Artifactory to set up my environment for my Docker build. And this will start allowing me to make a connection here of where did that war file come from. So this is actually where universal um, artifact repository shines. Um, you can use different tools as your Docker registry and in our example as your a Maven repository, and of course, for whoever of you who put other stuff in their Docker images, you probably should use and your NPM registry and your PyPy registry and your PHP Composer repository, and et cetera, et cetera. And all of them are good by themselves, but the problem is how do you correlate your Docker images with what went inside them? And everybody has to put something inside their Docker images. After all, the container idea is a very smart one, and no one in the world cares about empty containers. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I like running BusyBox. It's fun. I log into BusyBox all the time and, and type okay, LS. Except just Mark. All right. Um, none of you care about empty containers, um, and, and that's for a good reason. You put something inside. Now, it usually comes down to two different questions. What do I have inside a container? And that's the question that we are trying to answer now. Or the other way around, this application file, in which image it was contained? For answering both those questions, we need to correlate the application with the image itself. And if you run both of them on a single platform, like Universal Artifact Repository, like Artifactory, it's a very easy thing to do. I'm not claiming that it's impossible without, but it will be probably much harder without. But here, look at that. We have this war file listed as a dependency for our Docker build. By the way, it's not called SwampUp. It is not. But we what, it. We, what we can go, we, what we can do is take a look at it. And we will see here tons of information about it. And it has build of its own. This is actually our application build. It has its own Jenkins build results because it was a completely different build. It has its own commits, which are, of course, commits of our application code, right? And so here is the console output. We can take a look. And everything works. The build was successful. Some tests passed. And we deployed our build info to our factory. And getting back to... But we found a key, key information here, and we kind, of just, we kind of just waved by it just for a moment, but it's a key point. We now have the git commit hash of the actual application that was probably causing the problem. Because when we diffed the two containers, we saw that basically the only difference was the application itself. So if, my, if I have a culprit in my mystery of the broken container, this git commit hash is probably the, will tell me which, what coder I need to call up and tell to fix this stuff. You know what? This is Java. And Java might break for much more reasons than just an application commit. Any other ideas? Maybe the Java version was wrong in true. Jenkins when I compiled it. That's also true. How can true. I know it? Will, will my console output show me? Um, nah, no. it's not here. Where can I find it? Back in Artifactory. Back in Artifactory. You remember that we gathered all the environment information? We can go right here and ask for a Java version, right? And here it is. 
That's my Java version right there, right? So that might be a version. Or I want to compare with the previous build as we saw earlier. But you know what? Let's go back for, uh, for our Docker image and look, take a look at something else. So I'll go here. That's my Docker image number 15. And I want to see this manifest file. What's this guy? I have some critical in red, and that makes me nervous. So this is the other uh, great product that goes with uh, JFrog Artifactory, uh, JFrog X-Ray. Uh, and so X-Ray um, meets a need common to Docker registries of a need to scan binaries. And we really thought when we built X-Ray that you know, we're a company that has been studying the question of software binaries for a decade now and that we really wanted to bring that expertise of we know about how binaries are put together, how they relate to each other, and bring it into the space of a simple question of how do I find a binary? If I have a problem with a binary, what is the impact on other things? Interestingly enough, knowing the structure of binaries, all those and much more in the future, um, helps to analyze your software better. For example, what happens if you have a Docker image with a Debian package inside and a TarGZ archive inside and maybe you know an NPM package inside? The traditional scanners that scan our Docker images will probably stop somewhere on the level of the system dependencies. They will see this Debian file and they will say, well, we don't know what it is, so screw you. We don't have any answers for you here. But knowing how to go deeper and deeper recursively can find hidden gems like we have in our build. So here we have this line of build 16 was scanned because we submitted it to Artifactory and I find 10 issues, ouch. Let's take a look. Hidden gems, you said. Yes, those are definitely hidden gems and not Ruby gems, others. Here is a huge list of our Horrible, horrible vulnerabilities. And you know what? This one is interesting. This is Java. This is commons file upload stuff. And it was found when we submitted the Docker image. And it was actually found on some levels deep. This is an Apache Tomcat dependency, which actually lives in the lib folder of Apache Tomcat system dependency that was installed inside this layer. We know that because we know how Apache Tomcat package looks like. We know that if we open the lib folder, we will find a bunch of jars there, and if we analyze those jars one by one, we might find a vulnerability. But you know what? Let's take a look at another one. This one, even more fun. It comes from our application archive. Now, this guy is something that X-Ray never saw in its life. It doesn't know how to scan it. It doesn't know what it is. But the knowledge that this is a WAR file allows us to go deeper. Because we know that it's an archive. Inside there is a lib folder. Inside there are a bunch of jars. And some of them might have those horrible, horrible vulnerabilities. Right? Yep. And it, it, it works the same way for Bower, for NPM, for Ruby, for Python, not Ruby yet, Python, uh, Debian, RPM, and what's not. Yeah, and this can be inside or outside of containers, but you know, we're, we're at DockerCons, we figured we probably wanted to do a container-based example. Um, but you don't have to use containers to get this advantage. And the other way around, we can go from bottom up. We can say, okay, now we know that this jar is a horrible, horrible thing to have. Let's ask, which containers are impacted by it. In which containers we actually have this jar. And we can go and see the impact and say, okay, it is in a bunch of jar files, that makes perfect sense, and or war files. And those war files are, uh, where is it? Not, not this one? Yeah, those war files were built and deployed as a build by itself. And also they were contained inside a Docker layer, and this Docker layer is actually a part of a Docker of some Docker image that was built 
and submitted to Artifactory as well. Yeah. And we are out of time, so we have a couple of, I did too much slides, right? Way too much. But we have that. That's an important slide because we want to point you to this page, jfrog.com uh, slash show notes, in which tonight you will be able to see the video of this talk, the useless slides, the link to all the, all, the, all the links to the tools and the solutions that we talk about, right? And the feedback form and the raffle for thanking you to be here. And of course, the background here is just to remind you about how wonderful Napa is in the end of May. With that, thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us in the, in the very last session of the day. I'm William Dennis, uh, product manager on the Google Container Engine team and the Kubernetes team. And I'm talking about today how much Google loves containers and, and some ways that you can run those containerized apps in production. Um, and when I say Google loves containers, like we really do. We've been running on this stuff for about 12 years. Um, and we actually have three separate ways in Google Cloud to run your containers. We have uh, App Engine Flex, which is a, a product that launched uh, general availability just a month ago. Um, you can give it a container, and it'll give you all the, like your custom container, and it'll give you all the, all the magical scaling of, of App Engine. We have Google Compute Engine, you know, with multiple ways to run Docker images. You can use them as templates. You can have a managed instance group with a Docker image. Uh, that will auto scale. I think uh, even Docker has products that can run on GCE. And finally, we have the container engine, uh, which is the product I'll be talking about today. Um, the good thing is, regardless of which of those products you actually use on Google Cloud, they, they all share some benefits. And that is the benefit of Google Cloud. Um, this, this is one of my favorite uh, images that we have, actually. And this, is, this is showing the Google uh, Fiber Network. We have over 100 points of presence around the world, all connected by private dark fiber. And the benefit of that is that your packets, the packets from your customers to you, enter our network at the nearest point of presence, travel over Google Fiber right to your application. That's in contrast to other networking models, which are what we call like the hot potato networking, where your packet is like offloaded onto the public network as quick as possible. Um, and the reason you get this benefit is because Google runs so many other applications at scale, like, like YouTube, which have, which have massive demands on capacity. We also have a, a growing number of uh, actual locations where you can run your apps. So the, uh, all of the blue ones are actually coming online this year. All the purple ones are already in existence. And another great feature is the pricing. So we have a very, very kind of friendly pricing model. Um, and that is, if, if you use a, an instance for uh, more than 20 days, we automatically apply discounts. You can also uh, have like this committed use discount. And instead of you having to figure out and, and sort of capacity plan and work out exactly what you need, all of these pricing options are, are, are really friendly that you don't have to like think about it too hard, um, that they kind of just work. And, and you'll end up saving a fair bit of money, I think. The, the final point, and th for me, this is the most important one. Um, this is a quote from one of our VPs uh, at Google Cloud Next just recently, where he says that, you know, we're going to build the open cloud, and we're going to make it easy for you to come and leave, and we'll take our chances. Uh, and I think that's a really, really interesting sentiment. Like, we're actually going to make it easy for you to leave. And, and that's going to compel us to make the actual experience like, as good as we, ca as we can. Give you the best network, the best VMs, the best IOPS, the best everything, right? Um, because we know that you can just leave if you want. And, and we're going to enable that. Which brings me uh, quite nicely to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes uh, is an open source project. It's an orchestration system for running uh, Docker containers. Um, and what it is, is it's a container-focused um, sort of workload abstraction layer on top of cloud. And when I say uh, workload abstraction, what I mean is that rather than you thinking about machines, you think about workloads instead. So you might have a front end or a back end or a batch job. You might have a stateless or a stateful application. And Kubernetes lets you express those workload constructs, and it kind of abstracts all the rest of the detail away. It abstracts away all the compute, the networking, the memory, the persistent disks for you. That means that it's very portable. 
So you can run it on Google Cloud, you can run it on AWS, you can run it on Microsoft Azure, you can run it on premise, and you can hook things up multi-cloud as well. Um, it's also incredibly uh, resource optimized. So I think if, if you're at the keynote this morning, uh, you heard the, the sort of Tetris metaphor, um, that certainly applies to Kubernetes. So it, it will very efficiently uh, schedule your containers. It, it kind of looks at your instances as a, as a pool of resources on which to schedule things. Um, and that makes it very microservice friendly. So you know, I think e even if you have like three or four services, uh, you probably want to merge them and, and optimize them, you know, let alone if you have 20 or 50. Um, one of the benefits is if you have some spare capacity to handle unexpected load, um, when you merge all your workloads into, into one, that, that spare capacity is kind of shared across all of them. If one of them spikes, it can use that capacity and then you can add some more. Whereas if you're scaling everything separately, uh, you'll end up wasting that capacity. And so I want to make this claim that one day it might even save your data center if you get big enough. Um, I believe this is actually true for Google. So our, our own use of uh, containers has, has certainly led to some incredible efficiencies. And, and when you get a big enough scale, like, it can really make a big difference. So before I get into some demos, um, I need to cover a, a few kind of terms of art in Kubernetes. So I mentioned that it was an abstraction layer for, of, of workloads. One of the downsides of an abstraction layer is that we have all these abstract terms. Um, so I'm just going to quickly cover what those are, and then I'll do a demo that, that actually uh, shows all these things in action. So the first thing is a container. This one's not abstract. I think you know what this is. I hope you know what this is, since you're here at day two at DockerCon. Um, what Kubernetes does is it, it has this object called a pod, and a pod is just a collection of containers that live and die together. It's the smallest schedulable unit that we have. Often a pod will just be one container, but if you have two containers that are tightly coupled, then, then you would represent that in a pod. Then we have nodes. So a node is simply just a machine or a VM. Um, since we have like on-prem and we have uh, cloud, I guess that's why we have the word node uh, to cover both those. We have a thing called a deployment, and all a deployment is is a statement of how many pods you want, how many replicas of those pods you want. Um, and it will actually deploy those pods onto your nodes according to whatever specification you give it. One of the nice things is that it, it's actually a controller. It has this run loop, and it's constantly observing your cluster and driving it towards whatever desired state that you gave it. So here we have an example where there are two of pod A and one of pod B, and the, the observed state is matching your desired state. Well, what would happen if one of those nodes were to disappear? Let's say there's a hardware failure. Uh, that node is just gone. Well, the, container, the um, controller, the deployment controller, is, is con constantly monitoring this. And so it will actually observe, oh, wait a minute, there's only one pod of A now, and there's none of B. And it will actually reschedule those onto an available node. And then finally, the observed state will match the desired state, and we're, and we're all good again. The last abstraction that I want to point out is a thing called a service. And so a service is just a, a way to refer to a bunch of uh, pods that are all running the same thing. Um, you can expose a, a service as a node port. Um, that will put a, the same port on every single node in your cluster. Kind of uh, helps with discovery. Uh, any of the pods can just talk to the service using that node. They don't have to kind of know where it is in the cluster. And you can also expose it as a load balancer to the, to the world. All right, so let's, let's look at some examples of uh, running your Docker apps uh, in production with uh, Google Container Engine. Um, I want to point out that Google Container Engine is basically just pure Kubernetes. Um, the, my team actually contributes about 40% of the code to Kubernetes, so I think you can uh, fairly well trust that we can actually run Kubernetes fairly well. And we add a few extra features uh, from a cluster management point of view, so we have uh, node health checks and auto repair, and we have uh, cluster scaling as well. And with that, let's uh, try out a demo. All right, so I'm going to start with a, a really basic Rails application. This application, uh, I'll just show you the, the one thing it can do. It's basically just going to print out this hello DockerCon in the current time. So let's just run this locally. And you can see that's basically all it does. Very, very simple. 
All right, well with that, I'm now gonna build this uh, Docker build. And I'm tagging it there with a, a special tag that's uh, the Google Container Registry, my project name, and then whatever name I wanna give the image. Now that it's built, I'm gonna upload it. So this is uploading to your own private container registry that's hosted by Google. And now we're gonna deploy that image on Google Container Engine. So the first thing we're doing here is uh, kube control run. I'm giving it the name Docker demo. I'm specifying which image I wanna use and that's the image that I just built. Um, you can see that the tag matches. Um, I'm asking for a single replica, port 80. We're specifying a, a little bit of metadata there. And finally, the same command that you just saw me run. Uh, so now if we look at the pods in, in my cluster, we can see that it's spun up that pod. Next, I'm gonna create one of those service objects that I mentioned. This one's a load balancer type, so it's gonna actually expose that to the internet. We can uh, query the status of that load balancer now you'll notice that there's a pending external IP. That's because it takes about a minute to spin up. Uh, Google load balancers are, are pretty cool things. Um, what we'll actually be getting here is, a, is an IP that's an anycast IP, which means that um, no matter where your users are in the world, they just type in that IP. We'll route them to the closest uh, point of presence onto the Google Fiber and, and right up to your node. So that's, that's the sort of special secret here. You don't have to do any DNS tricks or anything like that. It's, it's simply an IP. Uh, so let's, let's observe that uh, as we wait. Um, and let's do some other fun things while we're waiting. So we only had one instance, one replica of that pod running. Um, what if I want 15? All right, here we go. You can see that uh, it's extremely, extremely quickly created those 15 additional instances. Um, one reason that was so fast is because this node has probably already cached that, that Docker image. Um, I'm also gonna watch here the actual deployment object that I created. Um, and you remembered I was talking before about the uh, current state and the desired state, and that, that's shown here. I probably don't need 15, so let's uh, scale it down to 10. And you can see it's terminating those nodes. Um, what if I wanted to replicate like a, a more disastrous thing? Let's say, uh, Let's say if I'm just gonna delete everything, we'll see what happens. So this command is just gonna delete all my pods. Um, but as I said, the deployment is, is looking at the observed state, which was zero. Um, the desired state, which was 10, it saw that they're all gone and immediately recreated them. All right, so by this time, it looks like we have one of those uh, anycast load balancer IPs. Let's see if that works. Give it a minute. No, they came back actually. Oh, okay. Just takes a little minute, there we go. Just takes a second for the health checks on the load balancer to, to pick that up. All right, so there we have the app, uh, the image that I showed you before running from my machine, now it's running in Google Container Engine um, on 10 replicas. All right, but um, I, think I, I think I made a capitalization error here. Uh, it's actually Docker with a capital C O N. So let's, uh, let's go and fix that real quick. And I'll show you how we update, how easy it is to update this image. All right, so I'm gonna build that and I'm gonna tag it with, a, with another name and, and you'll notice I'm not using latest, by the way. Um, probably is a recipe for disaster. Actually, it definitely is because if you use latest, then all the caching basically breaks. Um, all right, we'll push that up. Okay, so what I'm now gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna change the image of that deployment. So if you recall, this is the deployment that we created back, back then. Um, I'm gonna set that with the new image. And watch the, watch the pods here as this happens. So it goes pretty quick, but if you look here, it says up to date, there are two, four. The, the controller ha, ha, um, knows how many are up to date and knows how many are available. And, and again, it's driving that desired state to the current state. Um, so what it actually did, it, it would be good if I could show this in slow motion, but it's basically pulling one pod down at a time, replacing it, 
and, and that's in a rolling fashion. We call that a rolling update. All right, let's see. All right, hooray, apps updated. Okay, now what happens if I realize that I've just made a terrible mistake? Um, probably unlikely with capitalization, but use your imagination. The nice thing about this deployment is that it's tracking history for me. So we can see that we've got two revisions. The first one that I made right at the beginning of the talk and the second one just then. Um, so let's do a rollback. You, you can pick which revision you want or you can just say undo and it'll just go back to the latest one. And you can see that the rolling update is working again on the left here. Um, containers getting terminated and created with the new version. And again, that, that deployment there is driving that current state to, the, to be the desired state. Um, and and it, if, if you notice um, really carefully, that available drops to nine. So what we said in, in our rolling update conditions here is that we only want one, at most one to be unavailable. Um, so you would not have seen that go below nine. And all right, the application's rolled back. Okay, so that, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of just how to you know, docker, uh, dockerize the app and, and push it up into Google Cloud Registry and deploy it uh, on Google Container Engine. Um, and what I've showed you is actually production grade, right? You've got a production grade load balancer in front of that. Um, you've got that on a, a, a um, Google Container Engine cluster. If that was a real app, that, that, could, that could definitely be a production app. So far, though, what I've been using is these imperative commands. What I want to show you here is, is a way that you can actually uh, use Kubernetes through declarative config. So this is a little bit like Docker Compose if you use, if you use that. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm exporting that deployment that I created imperatively at the beginning. I'm exporting that as a YAML file into deploy.yaml. And you can see that it has the image that we deployed. Uh, it has the uh, command that we ran. Um, and I'll do that also for this service that we created. Those were the two things that we created. So if you're actually running a production system, this is definitely what I recommend doing. Um, you can actually commit these files into version control, and the, and the configuration can form part of your actual application. And I'll, I'll show you why that's really useful. Because right now I'm just about to delete everything that I just set up. All the containers terminated, our service is gone, our deployment is gone. Give that a second to catch up. All right, so from a disaster recovery point of view, if I've stored everything in configuration, let's just recreate it. So this is cube, cube control apply, and I've just given it the, the directory. So you'll notice here that I didn't, I didn't do two things like last time. I didn't do the deployment and then the service. I just said, just, just do the directory. Uh, and it's recreated everything back the way it was. And the interesting thing is, if you recall, when I originally made this deployment, there was only one replica. But because when I exported the configuration, I'd already scaled it up to 10, um, you'll see that, that 10 have come back here. So I'm just about out of time, but the final thing I just want to leave you with, um, which I won't have time to actually demonstrate, but that's the uh, pod autoscaler. So I demonstrated manually scaling things up and down. Um, Kubernetes also has a thing called a, a horizontal pod autoscaler that can, that can do that a little bit more automatically for you. Um, and I think that's actually a really important thing because you know, what's the point of having a system that can scale really high if you have to actually be there to do it, right? Like that just, I just don't get that. Um, so with the horizontal pod autoscaler, this one's set to observe the cluster and if, if the CPU utilization um, exceeds 25%, it'll actually schedule more pods. That feature works in conjunction with a feature we have in Container Engine called the uh, cluster autoscaler, where if this uh, schedules too many pods that, that we have nodes for, it will actually automatically provision more VMs and add that to the cluster for you. Um, so, well, I think I'm just about out of time, so thanks everyone for, for coming to the talk, and um, please uh, give this a try. One final plug, we do have a $300 one-year free trial, so if you like what you saw, you can try it out risk-free anytime you like. Thank you.